Hello all. So in this video, I will try to motivate you to learn Verilog. Okay. So what are the motivations for hardware description languages or HDLs in general? So you might be knowing all digital circuits, they are built using a single component, the transistor. So we need a bunch of transistors and some wires to connect them together. That's all we need for building digital circuits. That's what is making digital circuit design much easier compared to analog circuit design where you have a variety of components. You have resistors, you have capacitors, inductors, all kind of stuffs are there including transistors. But in digital we only have transistors and wires connecting them. So in the early days, the digital circuits, they contained a few thousand transistors and they were mainly hand drawn by engineers on sheets of paper. Okay, so these hand drawn uh, figures, these circuit diagrams, we call them a schematic. For example, this is the schematic of the first processor, Intel 4004, uh, which was designed in 1970. Okay. So it totally contained only around 2300 transistors. There were only four sheets of schematic. This is one of the sheets. Now, what you are seeing here, this is a NVIDIA Ampere GPU. This uh, chip as of 2020 holds the record for the GPU with the most number of transistor. So this chip has about 54 billion transistor. So you can see all the PT, the circuit design became very complicated. Okay, now we are talking about millions and billions instead of thousands. So there was a time where we used to call uh, digital circuits like LSI, large scale integrated circuits, MSI, medium scale integration, then VLSI, very large scale integration, then ULSI, ultra large scale integration, ELSI. So we used to call the circuits like that depending upon how many transistors are there. For example, 10 to 100 is a very small scale, then 100 to 1000, 1000 to, to uh, 10,000, like that. But nowadays uh, it, it makes no sense, so we have stopped classifying circuits based on the number of transistors. Nowadays we simply call the VLSI, very large scale integrated circuit. All of them we usually call them VLSI. The number of transistors that are increasing as years passes is based on something called Moore's law. This is not exactly a law. Uh, this was a prediction by Gordon Moore, who was a co-founder of Intel. So he predicted like the number of transistors, it will double every 18 months. And more or less, uh, we are seeing that happening or the period. So you can see this line, how the number of transistors inside a chip is increasing as time passes. So it's more or less doubling every 18 to 2 years. But you will also see other characteristics like the maximum frequency at which your processor is running or what is the maximum power consumption that your chip can tolerate is more or less flattening out. Okay. So the implications of these things we will discuss in a separate course on VLSI. Uh, here we are only interested in, in, in this curve. So basically we are saying circuits are becoming more and more complicated. So since they are becoming more complicated, it became impossible to manually hand draw these circuits. Right? You will need years and years of drawing thousands of papers to uh, physically draw them on a paper. So we decided to take the help of computers, okay, help of software to do this uh, schematic drawing. So it's interesting uh, to design a processor which is a hardware circuit. Nowadays we are taking the help of a software which is running on a simpler pro processor. So using a simple processor we can design a more complex processor. So the software applications that we generally use to design these circuits, not only digital, digital analog omic circuit, any kind of circuit, the software that helps us to do these things, we generally call them electronic design automation tools, EDA tools. Uh, for example, this course we will be using two EDA tools, the Intel Quartus and the Model Sim Intel Edition. So both, they come under the EDA tool, these softwares. So uh, the initial effort of so-called HDL, hardware description languages, was towards making this schematic drawing easier. That was the initial motivation. There are a number of reasons for it. Uh, one of them is using HDLs instead of using a pen and paper. You can make your design more concise. That is one advantage. Another advantage is uh, these HDL, you will see they are similar to your programming languages, C or C++. So they are written in text format using 
words and numbers and computers they are very good at processing text they are not very good at processing images uh, for humans it's the other way we are very good at processing images but we are not uh, very good at processing text anyway uh, text processing is much easier for computers so that is one motivation uh, for having HDLs instead of drawing uh, circuits as images or pictures now one important thing okay this confusion uh, exists among many people those who uh, do actual hardware design using HDL also hardware description languages they are description language you can see okay so we use these languages for describing a hardware now they are not called hardware design languages the design part how to make a circuit uh, how it should operate all those things you have to design first that is your job as an engineer you have to design your circuit at least uh, the functionality you should be able to design it then use our HDL such as Verilog to describe it now even if you have a good design in mind when you describe your circuit using an HDL language if you don't describe it properly okay you will get a, a different circuit it won't be what you actually wanted to implement so this is the same way we say in software it is a garbage in garbage out you describe it in a bad way you will get a bad circuit or even wrong circuit but you may see like later in the slide I am using the term design so even if I am using the term uh, always remember uh, what I mean is after designing it how you describe it okay we usually interchangeably use uh, description and design but HDLs are hardware description language we use them to describe our circuit now since it is a language all the nuances of other languages like our programming languages are applicable here also so we will have to learn some of the syntaxes the rules of the language the grammar of the language as well as the semantic okay the sense of the language so those things are applicable here also we cannot uh, describe our circuit in plain English language our idiot tools they still are not that intelligent to understand what you really want we still have to follow these rules of our HDL languages syntax and semantic and describe our circuit now later HDLs had other applications also so one of the most important application in earlier days and even today is design verification so once you describe your circuit once you design your circuit uh, before you send it for actual manufacturing you want to make sure your circuit is operating properly this is quite different from your software development in software development you write your code you compile it and the compilation works within seconds and if there is a error you can simply change the code and rerun it no issues but hardware design is not like that since it is physically manufactured uh, in a factory if you make any mistake it becomes almost impossible to correct it after manufacturing and the errors that you make in hardware design they are very costly they will be costing you millions of dollars even your company can go bankrupt due to sim simple mistakes so you can go ahead and search in internet the companies that have gone bankrupt in the hardware domain you will see very few companies they are uh, present in the hardware domain because of this the cost of manufacturing is very high so you should have a very good design verification you need to make sure your circuit your logic is working perfectly fine before you send it for manufacturing so this design verification we will be doing through simulations so we have software which can simulate our circuit which is being described using a HDL language uh, for example in this course we will be using the model sim uh, which is an EDA tool which is also a simulator we usually call it a logic simulator okay, because it's simulating our digital circuit later it was again found that uh, we can have more with our HDL so one application is called logic synthesis okay so in logic synthesis uh, the concept is very similar to our programming language development for example you can write a C code and the same C code you will be able to run on your PC environment on a mobile phone or even on a 
washing machine depending upon what kind of code you are writing okay so it's the same code but it can run on different platform that means your code is highly portable now how is it possible this is possible because of there are other software components which are taking your high level the c code and converting it to the appropriate platform for example our compilers are link linkers so same way uh, in hardware design also uh, we can build hardware in different ways okay one way is to develop so called asic application specific integrated circuit these are like dedicated chips used for doing dedicated operations for example the chip inside your computer which is controlling the wifi that is a dedicated chip for doing only only wifi control same way you can have a dedicated chip for controlling your bluetooth etc so these chips since the application is very specific we call them asic then you know your microprocessors they are not uh, for a specific purpose they are like more general purpose so we have like uh, general purpose microprocessors then we have gpus uh, specific for graphics processing uh, another platform is called fpgas which we will be using for this course which are called field programmable gate arrays uh, these can build flexible hardware okay so you'll be able to implement Uh, many circuits many times on these chips so don't worry about these terms we will uh, get into them in detail later now even if you are going for asic implementation specific chip implementation there are you might have heard different technologies so these technologies basically indicate what is the size of the transistor when you build a circuit so nowadays the popular one is called uh, 7 nanometer 7 nm technology that means the size of a transistor Uh, when you manufacture it on silicon is a 7 nanometer by 7 nanometer square it is that small okay then we have 10 nanometer 22 nm and and we have all the technologies also 45 nm 60 nm uh, 95 nm etc so as time passes the size of the transistor is becoming smaller and smaller and that being brings lot of other challenges also when we go for this miniaturization but in all these implementation no matter how you are implementing your circuit how the circuit behaves okay what is the functionality of the circuit remains the same so our idea is similar way we describe our software in a high level language like c we describe our oral circuit the behavior of the circuit using a hdl then we use different kind of eda tools and different manufacturing technologies to get them implemented so this makes your circuit design highly portable okay so generating a schematic or a circuit diagram for a specific platform so when we have a schematic previously i have shown a schematic right uh, how the transistors are connected now a, a schematic which is specific for a specific target for example i want to implement something on an fpga so i have a schematic targeting fpga these we call as netlists again details i will discuss later so logic synthesis what we basically mean is we take this hdl description high level description of your circuit in text format and convert it into schematic format called netlist now how netlists are stored netlists are usually again stored in text format but there are other software which can show them to you pictorially they read this text description and convert it into an image and you can easily view your circuit so that's what we call as uh, logic synthesis so the quarter software that we are going to use this for course has a built in Uh, synthesis application inside it it has lot of other applications also it supports synthesis also so it takes a hdl description like in our wait log and it will convert it into a netlist a schematic representation which can be implemented on intel fpgas now which are the different hdl languages so programming languages you know there are hundreds of them and there are certain reasons why we have hundreds of programming languages so we have specialized languages for specialized application so if you are going for system software operating system or driver development we usually prefer c or c++ uh, because of their closeness with hardware because of that they usually give better performance but now it is if you go for machine learning or ai we have languages like python or r uh, we prefer them because they are Uh, library rich you can quickly develop 
you have applications, etc. So that's the motivation here. But as far as HDL hardware description languages are concerned, we don't have hundreds of them. Uh, mainly, there are only two. Okay, one is called VHDL, which stands for Very High Speed Integrated Circuit Hardware Description Language. And other one is called Verilog, which doesn't have any special expansion. So VHDL, it has a military background. It was developed by the Department of Defense in US. So since it has a military background, uh, the language is quite strict regarding the semantic mainly. Uh, so it's quite strict. But Verilog, it was developed by an engineer in a company. So it is more flexible. So as you know, engineers, they like flexibility. So this is much flexible, but uh, the caveat here is uh, you may make silly mistakes when you write code in Verilog. Okay, so we should be more care careful when we write uh, code in Verilog uh, because many things in Verilog, they have a severity level of only warning. So even if you make a mistake, the tools, they will just give you a warning. They won't say you have made an error, but that is not the case of VHDL. So uh, again, we will see it when we are writing code, uh, what I really mean. So you should be quite careful when we write code in Verilog. Okay? Uh, but the main advantage is the Verilog uh, syntax and the keywords, they are more or less taken from C programming language. So those who have some C programming experience, they find uh, writing code in Verilog very, very easy. Now let me also add uh, VHDL and Verilog, they are complementary. Anything that you write in VHDL, you can uh, write in Verilog also, okay? Any circuit you can describe either in VHDL or in Verilog. If you properly describe it following all syntax and semantic, the same circuit you will be getting finally. So there is no better uh, HDL language. So if somebody asks, like even in some forums, you you may find like people claiming, if you write uh, your HDL in VHDL, your circuit may run faster than Verilog. There is nothing like that. Uh, whatever you write in VHDL, you can write in Verilog. Whatever you can write in Verilog, you can write in VHDL. Both are uh, quite feature-rich languages, and they are complementary. We are using Verilog this time because of your C background. Uh, so it is much easier to pick up and also for future courses also uh, some tools they support only Verilog. So it will be useful to know Verilog more than VHDL at this point. Now let me do a quick comparison between programming languages and HDL because till now you are used only programming languages. Okay? So when you use a programming language for software implementation, uh, your code will be finally executed by a processor. Okay, so that processor is a fixed hardware. It is pre-built, right? It is pre-manufactured. Now you take any processor, can be Intel processor like in our desktop environment, or an ARM processor in a mobile environment, or an Atmel processor in an Ember environment. You take any processor; it supports only a predefined set of operations. So these operations we call as instructions, okay? And the set of instructions, uh, they will be different for different processes. Uh, for example, add, that can be an instruction for adding two numbers, or sub, it can be an instruction for subtracting two numbers. So these are specific for each families of uh, processes. So no matter what complicated software you want to write, uh, you will have to implement your software using these predefined instructions. And these instructions will be finally stored in the main memory of the system, uh, which is usually a random access memory. And the processor will be reading the instruction from the RAM and executing it. Okay? But as I mentioned before, nowadays you don't have to worry about this low level instruction because you have other software component, such as the compiler, who takes your high level uh, language description, it doesn't matter C or Python, Java, in whatever language you write, the corresponding compiler or interpreter, he will take your code and convert it into a set of instructions that the processor understands. So that's how it is working. Another interesting thing about software, it is always sequential. That's why when you are writing software, we are following a certain order, right? So you have a particular line and the processor will execute that line. Only after that, 
it will go to the next line. So even if you have a multi-threaded system or multi-core system, multi-processor system, software is inherently sequential. It goes instruction by instruction. So important things to remember when you write uh, code using programming languages are your target hardware is fixed. Okay, it will be one of the hardware. Okay, but whatever hardware you are finally going to run this software is fixed. The set of instructions for this particular hardware is fixed. Now almost any algorithm can be implemented using these instructions. Okay, more or less any algorithm, any any application you can implement using this set of instructions and software is sequential. So these are the things we need to keep in mind when we look at a programming language. Again, my pictorial representation, so you will write your code in C, which is a text format, of course you know. Then you will give it to a compiler, for example, GCC compiler. The compiler, he will create an output, which is a binary file using only ones and zeros. We call it either a bin file or an executable file. Then that will get loaded to the main memory, to the RAM by the loader. Then our processor, he takes the instructions one by one and executes it. This is how software works. This is how programming languages work. Now let's look at the hardware description language flow. Okay, so first I have pictorial representation here, then we'll go to text. Okay, so here also first step is similar. You will have a source code. Uh, you will write your source code in text format, either in VHDL or Verilog by following all syntax and semantic. Then you will give it to a software, which, okay, if you compare with software flow, is similar to your compiler, okay. So you will have a synthesis tool. In our case, we will be using a software like Quartus. So he takes your uh, HDL description and from that he creates the netlist. So as I mentioned before, the netlist uh, basically specifies how the transistors or how the gates are connected together. It is stored in a text format, but it is possible to see it in a pictorial format also with the help of some other software. We will have like netlist viewer or something which will show you pictorially so that you can easily understand. But uh, internally, the system will be using a textual representation. Okay. Now this netlist, then we will have to give it to some other tools, okay, which will create some other files and finally we will be using those files to manufacture our final chip. Okay. So when we discuss Verilog, we are not much worried about this part, we are only worried about the source code, synthesis and getting the netlist. There could be a parallel path where we give the same source code to a simulator also and we will check whether the output is right or wrong. So HDLs are used for, okay, as I mentioned, designing or describing the hardware itself okay, with the help of software. Okay, we are doing hardware description with the help of software. Okay. So HDL, they are usually used in the first step of chip design. Okay. And the software which are used in this first step of uh, chip design they are usually called front-end tools. The EDA tools that we are used in the initial step, for example, the synthesis here or the simulator, we call them together as front-end tool. Because when you look at job advertisement, you may see like front-end design engineer. What they basically mean is uh, those who write HDL code. Now, EDA tools which are used for more complex things. For example, here I have put a step like implementation. Okay. So actual placement of your transistor, actually connecting this transistor, checking whether uh, the timing requirement, we will do timing analysis or not, don't worry, whether it is uh, properly happening. The tools which do these kind of thing, we call them backend tools. So we have frontend tools, backend tools, frontend engineers we have, backend engineers we have. And the output from synthesis, the netlist, it goes through many other steps and finally, if you are building an ASIC, okay, finally we will send it to a factory. Uh, these factories are usually called FAPs, uh, standing for fabrication factories, where they will be actually uh, built into silicon. Okay? For example, we have TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, 
UMC, United Manufacturing, different kind of uh, factories are there. Samsung, they have own factory, Intel, they have own factory. So they will be finally sent to these factories where they actually get into the real chip. That is in case of ASIC, application specific integrated circuit. Or if we have those so-called FPGA chips, which we have in our lab, uh, we can implement our circuit on those FPGAs also, no problem. We don't have to send it for any manufacturing. So important things to remember when we go for HDL design, they are used for hardware design. The HDLs are part of hardware design, okay? Although they are used for describing. Hardware is inherently parallel, unlike software, which is sequential. Hardware is parallel because you have many transistors, many gates in your circuit. All of them can work concurrently in parallel. So HDLs, they support concurrent modeling. Okay, so this has some implication uh, in the order in which you write the code. So in software I mentioned it is sequential, so it is very important the order in which you write the code because uh, you execute one line, then only you go, go to the next line, so on and so forth. But since hardware is parallel, uh, there will be more flexibility. For example, here when you write your hardware description, you can say like this N3 is connected to N5 in one line, then you can write N4 is connected to N5 in the next line. Okay, so that's how you will write the code. But it is perfectly fine to write N4 is connected to N5 first, followed by N3 is connected to N5. That's also fine because both describe the same circuit. So you will see in, in many times when you write the code for hardware, HDLs, the order really doesn't matter. Okay, so sometimes that's an advantage, sometimes that makes our life very difficult also because in software it will be relatively easier to debug it because you know things are going one after one after one after one sequentially but in hardware things are happening in parallel so where this thing is happening where your code is breaking it may be a little bit difficult to find by looking at the code that's why we need simulators. Another feature that you will find in hardware design, which you usually don't find in software design, unlike you design software for some kind of real-time system, is the concept of time, okay? So in software, in most cases, you cannot predict the latency, the delay. So you ask the software to do something, how much time it will take exactly to do it, it won't be, you won't be able to predict it. Sometimes it may take half a second to add two numbers. Sometimes it may take uh, 0.1 second to add a number. So different time, uh, at different instances, it may take different time. And we are usually not worried about it. But hardware is not like that. Hardware is highly deterministic. So when you give an input to a piece of hardware, when the output will come, okay, after how many milliseconds or how many nanoseconds or after how many so-called clock cycles, the output will come is highly deterministic. So this concept of time will definitely come while we are coding that you might haven't seen when we are writing software code. Okay? So mainly two things uh, are different from our normal software coding. When you are writing HDL, the concept of parallelism, concurrency, Concurrency also comes in software coding. If you have done some multi-threading coding, it will come, but most cases that is not the case, right? So parallelism, concurrency, and the concept of time. So these two separates HDL style of coding from our traditional uh, programming language coding or software coding. Now, what is the future of HDL? Okay, so the latest trend in hardware design is HLS or high level synthesis. So this started maybe from 2010, 2011 from that period and it became popular in less than last five years actually. So in HLS what happens is instead of using HDL to describe your hardware, you model your hardware using a high level language such as C. Okay? So you describe, or here I should not say describe, you rather model the behavior of your circuit using C or C++. Now, we have other EDA tools, okay, HLS tools, so-called, which will take the C description 
and from that it will generate HDL, Verilog or VHDL, the intermediate representation. Now once we have Verilog or VHDL, we can follow the traditional steps and finally manufacture the chip. Okay, So that is the latest trend. So if that is the case, so does it really worth learning HDL or Verilog? Okay? Uh, at least for me, the answer is yes, you should definitely learn a HDL if you are trying to become a digital circuit designer. Uh, there are many reasons, HLS it is still a developing field, lot of research is happening, tools are coming, new tools are coming, new features are being added to HLS, that is one reason, it is not yet matured. Even if HLS matures, HDLs won't go away. Okay? So the best comparison is no matter which programming language is introduced now or in the future, the importance of C or C++ is never going to go away. Because C or C++, they are so close to hardware okay, for getting the best performance, for exploiting all the features of your hardware, finally you will have to write some part of your code in C or C++. Same way to have a very optimized hardware, very high performance hardware, you will have to still describe your hardware using HDL. Okay? Again, this is my opinion, personal. There may be people who feels like HDLs will go away. Maybe, possible. Maybe at some point of time they may go away, but at least for foreseeable future, they are not going to go away, they will be still there. And I will emphasize the most important reason for learning HDL is if you want to be a good HLS designer, a high level synthesis designer, you should be a good, good HDL designer because the output from HLS is still an HDL, with logo VHDL. Okay? So if you want a highly optimized HDL, you will have to write a highly optimized HLS. So only if you know the relation between the HLS and HDL and the final circuit, you can be a good designer. So it really makes sense to learn HDL and uh, we are going to learn Verilog hardware description language. So in the next uh, video, we will write our first Verilog code like our Hello World code in Verilog. Okay, see you then. Thank you.